Hello and welcome to the print. I have with me today Dr. Mirwais Balki. He was, uh, he is rather Afghanistan's former Minister of Education. He joined the Ministry of Education under the former Republic government in 2018. Prior to that, he was also at the Indian, at the Afghan Embassy in New Delhi as a Deputy Chief of Mission. He's done his education in India. And prior to the Taliban takeover, he was also uh, at the American University in Afghanistan as a lecturer. However, post the takeover of uh, Afghanistan by Taliban, he had to escape, uh, considering the fact that many uh, brilliant minds have been uh, leaving Afghanistan uh, with the security situation there worsening. Uh, welcome to the print, Dr. Balki, and thank you so much for giving us your time. Thank you very much, Mr. Basu. Thank you. Um, so I, let me just um, first ask you, you know, as, a, as an Afghan yourself and as a former uh, government employee, you've worked in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, in the Ministry of uh, Education, uh, under the former uh, Ashraf Ghani administration. How would you assess today uh, whatever is happening in Afghanistan? You were there for a, for a few months post the Taliban takeover. And, uh, you know, you've seen those years of democracy there and today you are seeing what's happening there. Uh, you still have your, I'm sure your family there. So how would you assess this one year of uh, Taliban rule there? Well, uh, uh, unfortunately, I'll assess a, a total catastrophe for Afghanistan in the past one year and the Taliban uh, because uh, Alongside uh, the the collapse, the gradual collapse of the uh, twenty years achievement that you you talked about, from democratization to progress and development, unfortunately uh, there is a gradual collapse of the governance system in Afghanistan, and uh, uh, so uh, in all dimensions, in all uh, levels of the civilians' life, the citizen lives. You do not have a source of hope to the people so that they can meet their uh, expectations uh, in the country. Uh, above all, unfortunately, uh, the, the society is facing a low quality education beside that there is a ban on girls' education in Afghanistan. Half of the population of the country, they are uh, not going to the school and they are deprived of being uh, a skillful citizen in the future of Afghanistan. So uh, these all, uh, the current situation and past one year situation uh, is resulting to the growth of radicalism in Afghanistan and Afghanistan is turning, uh, unfortunately, a safe haven to the national, regional and international terrorist networks uh, uh, that, that, that is the condition. So if I brief it, I'll say that an anarchism is prevailing in Afghanistan with no any uh, obstacle and limitation. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, from Afghanistan, yes, we are hearing this reports of immense violence. Uh, we are also hearing a lot many Afghans talking about the fact that the Taliban, this Taliban is not different from the previous Taliban. Um, this is this can be a Taliban 2.0, but their their style of operation is still the same. However, those voices are mainly coming in from Kabul, uh, outside of Kabul, and there are many scholars otherwise also who say that you know maybe uh, this is too early to assess them, uh, give them some time, and also the fact that you know um, they are sort of uh, they know that you know that the world is watching them. Yet we see uh, terrorists being sheltered there. We just saw uh, th that, you know, Ayman al-Zawahiri was staying in the center of Kabul uh, and uh, that house was owned by Sirajuddin Haqqani. So how would you see this uh, kind of policies? And uh, when we talk about recognition, how do you think uh, while the countries are, many countries are engaging with them, including India, uh, how do you think they'll get the recognition or you think again, like the previous regime, previous uh, earlier time, uh, they are their rule is very short-lived. 
Well, first of all, you better know that uh, they do not have any ground legitimacy among the people of Afghanistan because some of the protocols, some of the uh, uh, normalcy you may see in Kabul, that is also not to all the people, all the civilians in Kabul. Outside Kabul, if you stay uh, uh, just a meter outside of the boundaries of Kabul, then the situation is very worse and, and people... Uh, they do not uh, report the, what, what are going the uh, ground realities. Unfortunately, from extrajudicial shootings uh, of, of, the, of the former employees and former ANDSF soldiers to many other people who have been at the center of the hatreds of Taliban's fighters, uh, they had their hostilities, they had their own uh, expectations or whatever. So uh, that is the condition even, I assure you that some of the uh, sympathizers of Taliban who have been supporters in different villages in different parts of the country, now even they are the uh, critics of Taliban and they turned against Taliban because they were expecting a better life and as according to the traditional or low cultural values life that they had, they were supporting the Taliban. Now they are saying that uh, the Taliban's they are going different paths, different ways. So uh, a kind of uh, uncertainty is prevailed in the country, and that gives a very ambiguous, ambiguous situation and perspective for the countries outside Afghanistan, especially those who are concerned and those who are engaged in Afghanistan issues. They uh, I am sure that they are also accused what to do with, with, with Taliban because you do not have a single address, you do not have a single leadership, you do not have any kind of commitment from the Taliban. What they were addressing initially, uh, I believe you were also in Kabul at the same time when Taliban uh, take over Kabul. So that time, you, you may remember the first address given by uh, which was uh, drawing the foreign policy of Taliban and their perspective over regional uh, countries, but they are not going the same way. Uh, that is why, uh, since there is no uh, ground legitimacy for Taliban, since there is no any commitment from Taliban to the uh, to the to the to regional promises, and since there is no any. Uh, kind of normalcy in the country, uh, I, I don't think there would be any kind of recognition from the countries in the region, even those who are supporting Taliban very strongly. Uh, so uh, that will shorten the lives of the Taliban government, even comparing to the first Taliban's rule in Afghanistan, which ran for uh, to, uh, five years, at this time, this time, even they would not uh, long last that 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 way. Mm -hmm. So you were the minister of education. Now, if I come to this uh, burning issue of not letting Afghan girls uh, study, uh, it's been now almost uh, six months, and um, you know the fact that whenever the Taliban is questioned about it. They say that this is a cultural issue. It's a temporary phase. Uh, it'll all be uh, smoothened out. Um, you know, the girls are getting, uh, they are studying in higher, uh, you know, universities for higher classes, but it's only the primary school. But we know that this is going to have long-term implications. And how would you, uh, you know, assess or compare the, the education scenario in Afghanistan today vis-a-vis uh, -vis what it was when you were the minister? I think the differences uh, in progression and backwardness. Uh, at, at the time when we were uh, running the uh, education system in Afghanistan, uh, we were focusing on progression of quality education in Afghanistan because we had passed the uh, quantity-oriented policies to, to, to attract all the girls and boys uh, to the education, to the schools. And then we were talking about the numbers, the estimations, the statistics, uh, the quality education, the curriculum. And 
certain other issues which are the components of a quality education. But now things are going reverse, uh, Ms. Basu. You better know that nowadays even they are changing the general education schools to the madrasas, to religious uh, madrasas. And also they are not at all encouraging even boys to study certain skills and competencies to, to be a, a responsive and a, a better citizen to Afghanistan. So uh, this is the big, the big difference. Though there is poverty, there is some cultural uh, obstacles in certain specific areas of tribal uh, 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 parts of the country. But uh, that are also uh, uh, resolvable because when we were talking with the elders of the tribal people, when I was at the Ministry of Education, some of the tribal leaders groups, they were very much sympathizing with, with education, with girls' education, and they were supporting, but with a little bit different approach. Of course, not the modern approach, which we had in Kabul and other major cities in Afghanistan. For example, distance learning, for example, educational package, for example, women teacher, and other educational infrastructure and environment for women and girls, we were providing for those families in the, in the outskirts of the uh, cities in the border area, especially. So that was going on uh, as a normal situation. But now, unfortunately, uh, the Taliban, which was then also uh, an obstacle to education, to quality education, poverty and low cultural values, these three obstacles of quality education in our time is dominating nowadays Afghanistan. So uh, I'm not only concerned about girls' education, I'm concerned about education itself in Afghanistan because the low quality education and the radicalized education of uh, the, the madrasas and the school will uh, you know, prevail uh, and pave the situation for more recruitment of the young generation to the uh, terrorist networkings and to different other organizations for their global purpose. And you better know that what, what they are following. That is why uh, they are, destroying the, the infrastructure of education in Afghanistan. So education is the biggest crisis nowadays in Afghanistan, above all because the 20 years or, or the, the half a century years crisis in Afghanistan is the result of a poor education in the country. So since they are not focusing on that, and since they are taking education as an instrument or a strategic asset for for, for uh, terrorizing, unfortunately, I see a big crisis in the near future of the country. Okay, but, but Dr. Bakhti, what you said is very crucial because you are saying that while, uh, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the world media is talking about Afghan girls' uh, education, you were worried about the entire education system and you're saying right. that some of the modern education is being converted to the kind of... Uh, you know, education they receive uh, in the madrasas. And the fact that even boys' education can be adversely impacted, is that happening only in, uh, I mean, I'm sure that's happening in provinces, but does that, is that also happening in Kabul? Well, you better know that Afghanistan is not Kabul. Uh, uh, majority of uh, more than 90% people Absolutely. in Afghanistan are the, the the rural people and uh, they are uh, the people who have the influence in Afghanistan. One of the main factor of the Taliban uh, re-emergence in Afghanistan was because re they recruited from uh, outside Kabul and different other areas. But yes, in Kabul also because uh, first of all, there is always a flow of the rural people to the urban cities in Afghanistan, which is a gradual process which was then happening and now it is also because of the flood, because of the earthquake, because of the poverty, because of many other factors and reasons, they are flowing to Kabul and they are settling in different parts of Kabul. Uh, most of these people, even then when I was visiting, when I was meeting uh, these people, 
the 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 uh, displaced people. Some of these people even they were saying that we will not send uh, our girls to education or even our boys. They have to go to the market and earn something for the family. So this number is being added day by day, and there's no governance to control and to 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 uh, give services to these people. So. Uh, that that is one fact, and the other fact is that yes, uh, the Taliban, they uh, in different uh, uh, you know opportunities, they are always saying that first of all we have to build madrasas in different districts of Afghanistan, which Kabul also has many districts, and at the same time uh, there is a heading curriculum, unfortunately, for Afghan students, which talks about anti-imperialism, anti-Westernism, anti-secularism, anti-democratization, and many certain terminologies they are using nowadays. And even they, they announced that we want to be, bring reform to the curriculum and we have to remove some of the democratic values, secular values from the book, which, which the, the current books, the current curriculum in Afghanistan education system was also written by the ulema scholar, by the religious scholars in Afghanistan, they had their endorsement for all uh, the chapters that, that we brought to the education. So when they are changing these endorsed education uh, curriculum in Afghanistan, which means they are bringing a, a new uh, a curriculum which talks about all radicalization and their own ideologic values. Mm -hmm. Well, um, that is that is hugely tragic, and that is something that you know uh, is is a lot more concerning, uh, considering the fact that the entire education system is also collapsing there, among other things. But now, shifting the focus a little bit on the foreign policy, also since you've been at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, you are also uh, you know you you are a, a doctorate on international relations. Now, if I can ask you in terms of um, Taliban's foreign policy. How do you see that happening? Um, and in terms of also uh, when the takeover happened, how did you uh, find the role played uh, by some of the countries in you know, safely evacuating uh, some of the Afghan citizens who wanted to leave the country, um, that which also includes India, that changed the visa system and converted into <coughs> visas. Uh, students are still wanting to come to India on, on scholarships. Um, they are not able to do that. So, uh, how would you how would you assess all of that? Well, first of all, I believe that there is no foreign policy when we talk about Taliban. It's a, a foreign relations, basically, uh, because uh, you better know that the, the, the foreign policy is. Uh, uh, with the government, with a recognized government, with a very uh, defined asset and defined goals. But this is the foreign relation of an organization in Afghanistan which took over the country. And that is why based on the organization's priorities and perspective, they are defining their relations with the countries in neighboring Afghanistan or uh, in the region. And that is, I always say, a composition of the nationalism, radicalization, and tribalism, which is combined together, and that defines the the the, the boundaries of or the objectives of this or, uh, organization. So, when you combine these three, every country has a meaning a, a, as a position for Taliban. For example. What is India's position here? What is Iran's position here? What is U.S. positions here? Is based on these three, uh, uh, you know, uh, combinations. So that is why, uh, when they are defining uh, nowadays their relations with the countries outside Afghanistan, that is completely different that, than 20 years back when they were fighting against uh, uh, NATO and ANDSF. That time. They were taking some of the allies to fight against NATO uh, and uh, Afghan government. But now, since they are in power, they have changed their behaviors and approach towards their own allies. For example, Iran was one of the supporters of Taliban. Now they say they see Iran a very different country, a Shia government, a Persian speaking government, 
and also uh, they have their own uh, Iranophobia among themselves. Like that, even I say that they will turn against Pakistan also because there are certain factors behind uh, which is prevailing among the Taliban fighters, and that will be an obstacle to a good relation or a, a honeymoon period between Pakistan and, uh, and Taliban. Uh, they have an in, in, Indophobia, Indophobia also, because in the, in the common memory of Taliban, they always think about the, the, the historical memory, uh, how they see uh, uh, India. Uh, that is why some of the top leadership, some of the main commanders of Taliban, they have fought in Kashmir against India, uh, in Kargil, and, and from that time, so uh, these kind of memories are shaping the foreign relations of Taliban. Uh, that is why uh, the countries, uh, since they did not recognize the Taliban government, that is what these are the factors and they are concerned because they say, if, if for example, if it's not a foreign policy, then there is no a clear defined objectives. It is a relations based on the circumstances. So if they are, emotional, they will deliver any kind of speech against that country. If they are happy, if you gave them bribe, if you gave them certain ransom, then they are with you. So that kind of uncertain situation from the Taliban foreign relation uh, objectives uh, is confusing other countries uh, in the region and, and abroad. So one, one is th these facts. And the other fact is that those who are parts of evacuation from Afghanistan, uh, the evacuation process and, uh, you know, save Afghan people, uh, these were not in a proper manner. You, you have seen yourselves, you are an eyewitness of that situation. That's why I did not manage to go by the Kabul airport to get out of the country because I was ready to be shot by Taliban in Kabul then, uh, you know, humiliating myself in that situation. Like me, thousands and thousands of Afghan families, they were not ready to, to, to go for that, that situation, especially uh, on the second, third, and after that. So uh, uh, these uh, situations or these uh, uh, facilitations were not in a, in a, in a proper position. Uh, India government also, uh, did not meet the expectation, uh, expectations of the people because the, uh, the visa was announced by the external ministry but never issued by, to the Afghans. Many people, they, they uh, proposed and they requested for that visa but uh, no one was issued, unfortunately. Uh, now also, the situation is going uh, the same same, same uh, as it was uh, last year. So that is why the people in Afghanistan, they are confused that how the countries are seeing the Taliban, how the countries are seeing the people of Afghanistan. And uh, that is why I believe that uh, there are a certain complaints from the people of Afghanistan to the regional allies, to the neighboring countries. Mm -hmm. um, also, since you talked about, you know, the ordeal that you had to face um, the day that the Taliban took over and everything sort of collapsed, uh, the Taliban said that, you know, they will be giving amnesty to the uh, former Afghan government officials, they will be including them uh, within their system and also the former Afghan, uh, you know, soldiers. But what happened to that? Why did uh, people like you, uh, who who are like an asset for Afghanistan, you had to leave, and several uh, people and families like yours, uh, you had to leave. When we talk about Taliban and amnesty, uh, we have to uh, be a little bit specific which Taliban and what kind of amnesty, because you better know that in Afghanistan, the, the political rationality of the Taliban is not up to that level so that they can keep their promises and they can have a hierarchical uh, uh, order so that they can bring security to the people of Afghanistan. Every day we are witnessing extrajudicial shooting of the people. Just yesterday, 
the former chief of the police of my district was shot dead by Taliban uh, in the public, not uh, somewhere, you know, uh, in, a, in, the, in a corner of a place so that the people are not witnessed. Like that, every day in the different corners of the country, the ANDSF former soldiers, the employees, and some other people are uh, being shot. So uh, the, 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 the Taliban fighters, the soldiers, they are not following the orders of the leadership in Kabul. That, that's because of the hatred that they have in the past 20 years fighting against Afghanistan's government. That is why uh, I was there for two weeks. I was in Kabul in different parts of Kabul, and I was expecting that maybe there would be differences as the people were talking about the changes of Taliban in the uh, 2.0. So that's why I was also thinking that maybe there are some differences and there would be amnesty for the people. And we will survive in Afghanistan to work for Afghanistan as uh, it, 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 it has been always our dream. But when we got the exact reports of our friends detained, tortured, uh, humiliated, and, and killed, so we were thinking that is, uh, you know, the, 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 the time to get out of the country. So that's why uh, uh, the, the big reason behind to leave Afghanistan is the daily uh, uh, worst situation and news that we were receiving from different parts of the country, and we are receiving nowadays also. The news which is broadcasting from Afghanistan is maybe one out of 100 cases that we are witnessing every day. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, my last question to you, Dr. Barkhi, and thank you for giving us uh, so much insight. What is happening to the National Resistance Front um, the erstwhile Northern Alliance. Do you have any hope left that uh, they are sort of regrouping? They will be confronting the Taliban. There are little pockets of resistance within Afghanistan. And of course, the Panjshir Valley resistance continues. But we do not have Mr. Masood inside Afghanistan or, or Mr. Amrullah Saleh. So what is happening to that? Is there any hope uh, left on that? Well, first of all, they are there. They are fighting uh, every day bravely against uh, the Taliban for the freedom and for the liberty in Afghanistan. Uh, though they are not in the major cities because uh, the, the collapse of Afghanistan did not lift any space for them to, to remain in a city, but uh, not only in Panjshir, in, uh, in Baghlan, in Badakhshan, in Takhar, in Balkh, in Faryab, in Ghur, in different provinces of Afghanistan. They are fighting proxy nowadays and they are fighting uh, extensively uh, against Taliban. So the resistance, one side, of course, it is NRF, which is fighting uh, militarily against Taliban. There is a, a, an enormous resistance against Taliban everywhere in the country. You better know uh, than me, you're following the reports from Afghanistan the woman resistance, the intellectual resistance, the ethnic uh, and religious uh, resistance, almost all the uh, levels, all the stratas, all the groups and people in Afghanistan, they are somehow resistance, uh, resisting against, against Taliban. So uh, overall, these general resistance is a big factor, a big source of hope so that they can defeat any despotic regime which is installed in Afghanistan and uh, they are uh, ruling people uh, unwillingly. So that is why uh, I believe that the National Resistance Front also will gain more and more spaces, more and more legitimacy among the people, uh, and more, more, more and more recruitment. And they have that passion and the people are also supporting. I believe that that's the main factor. Although uh, they are nowadays abandoned and no one is supporting outside Afghanistan, but based on their own capacities and their own passion that they have, they're fighting. And I hope that uh, I'm, I'm sure that they, they will they will be a, a very 
balancing and leveraging power in Afghanistan to suppress Taliban and to convince Taliban that they cannot rule Afghanistan with a single, you know, radicalized ideologic uh, regime. Mm -hmm. But what about the resources issue? I, I believe the NRF is facing some resources issue. And do you think um, that is also sort of uh, emboldening the, the Taliban? Or is the Taliban really uh, scared of the NRF? First of all, uh, if there was uh, more resources to the NRF, now they would have been prevailing in all uh, even major cities in Afghanistan because the people are welcoming them. Uh, but uh, they, are, they are using the resources that we have in Afghanistan. Uh, Afghanistan, unfortunately, is a, 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 a weapon market nowadays. There are uh, every corner of the country you can find and you can, you can take that. So they're using that, that opportunity, that available uh, uh, weapons that they have and they're fighting. The Taliban are afraid of the NRF and other resistance groups because uh, they know that they are the potential threats against uh, the existence. That is why uh, every time they are uh, campaigning towards uh, uh, copies of Panjshir, Andarab and all these places, and every day they are retreating uh, against the NRF. So uh, every, uh, I think every week, if you take the average of the resistance prevailing in Afghanistan, every week you have a new front in, in a place in Afghanistan. Last week there was a front opened in the central parts of the country in Afghanistan, in the whole province. So uh, there are uh, now new news from the Western Afghanistan. So uh, in, in the Southern Afghanistan, also people are fighting uh, uh, against a little bit unorganized, but they're fighting. So uh, I believe that every day, every week, we will be witness of the enlargement of the, the resistance forces against Taliban. Uh, so once when they are being supported by any country or any allies, uh, uh, regional allies, I believe that they can be uh, the balancer of power in Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. well, thank you for giving us your time and thank you for talking to the print. You please take care. Thank you very much.